Welcome, I'm Jane Hansen, and this week in the arena, looking for a few good men and women, the crisis invocations, and what the Diocese of Brooklyn is trying to do about it. The numbers are sobering. Last year, there were only 480 ordinations to the priesthood in this country, about half as many as in 1965. This means more parishes are going without a resident priest, and more dioceses, including Brooklyn, are relying on priests from other countries. Just this week, though, Pope Benedict declared a year of the priest to begin in June to help draw attention to the priesthood. Joining us are some people who have already been paying attention to the priesthood. Father Kevin Sweeney, Vocations Director for the Diocese of Brooklyn, Rod Nev Lepomere, a seminarian in the diocese, and Rafael Perez, a discerner who is in residence at the John Paul II House of Discernment in Brooklyn. Thank you all so much for being with us. Father Sweeney, let's start with you. You think the, the Holy Father is concerned about vocations? Well, hearing now uh, him declaring a year of, uh, of the priesthood, I think it shows uh, something that's been clear since he started even before he was Holy Father as Cardinal Ratzinger, um, and certainly following the lead of uh, Pope John Paul II. Um, yes, vocations is such a, a priority for us as the church. Uh, we see good things happening, I think, on the universal level in terms of certain areas of the world. Uh, there's been a great response uh, to, to the call. I think Pope John Paul II was such a dynamic um, uh, force and, and, and inspiration to so many young people, both men and women, to, to consider the Lord's call to priesthood or religious life. Um, we have some challenges in our country and uh, in the, maybe the western part of the world, uh, but our Holy Father Pope Benedict is saying that um, we have to uh, give thanks, I think, to those who have answered the call and are serving as priests and, uh, and, and realize that we need to, um, as uh, Bishop DeMarzio likes to say, put out into the deep and, and um, challenge and invite young people, and sometimes not so young, to, to realize that the Lord could be calling them to these beautiful vocations. You talked about the challenges. How much of that is today's culture? It's a big part of it. It's, a, it's, it's certainly a big part of it. Uh, uh, we see struggles in, in families uh, and so many vocations to priesthood or religious life come from the example of parents, a family that prays together, a family that, that values the faith. Uh, and it's difficult times, I think, uh, for parents to be raising young children. Uh, there are so many challenges that our, that our culture uh, presents to us as people of faith, as Christians, as Catholics. There's a lot of good things in our culture, but uh, there's some of the positive things in our culture like opportunities to go to college and um, for careers and uh, the opportunities that are there for young people today, uh, it makes it sometimes, I think, a little more difficult for them to, to think about sacrificing some of those great opportunities, what could appear to be a, a big sacrifice uh, to, to answer the Lord's call to, to enter the seminary or to enter a, a religious community. You've uh, done something a bit unusual, um, or at least it's, it's certainly an effort to help people recognize their call with the House of Discernment. Yes. Can you explain to me what it is, and then we'll talk to Raphael about it? Sure. Um, it's really the, um, uh, the inspiration of Bishop DiMarzio. It, he had one when he was bishop in Camden, and he wanted, has, since I started more than four years ago as vocation director, he's saying, I think we should have a House of Discernment. We looked at different places and planned and thought about it for really a couple of years, and uh, it's, it'll be a year now, last April, that we open the Pope John Paul II House of Discernment. And the House of Discernment is different from the seminary in that the guy doesn't have to leave where he's going to school or his job. He can be in the House of Discernment and kind of continue doing what he's doing as a student or working, but he's gonna have a community life, he's gonna have an opportunity to pray, to pray. Uh, he's gonna have a spiritual director, and the chance to think about the seminary. Could we call it kind of like a halfway house in some ways, towards the priesthood, <laughs> really? Um, in some ways, yes, I uh, think. Okay, so Raphael, you've been there for about six weeks. Uh, six, seven weeks like that. All right, and you're a high school teacher. Uh, right now, yes, I am getting my degree in, and to be a high school teacher, I'm doing student teaching. All right, so you're a, a high school teacher and we all know that can be a difficult job at best. <laughs> I mean. It, at its worst. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but So you make this decision that you're going to go live in this house with several other men mm -hmm. to really explore whether or not you want to become a priest. Yes, in, in many ways that is correct and also whether or not uh, w to discern whether God is calling me in that direction. Um, as Father mentioned, it is, a, it is a blessed place and a blessed opportunity to really kind of get your antennas up. And, and really start to pay closer attention to God's call. Who are these other, these other men that are there? Old, young? Variety of ages. There are um, some who are in their late teens, uh, early 20s. One fellow's even in his early 50s. 
So we really run the gamut as far as ages are concerned and even nationalities. And didn't you say that one of the gentlemen that's there is a deli owner? <laughs> he, yes, he actually <laughs> manages and, and is a co-owner in a deli, going to school at the same time, in fact. Well, how difficult is it, though, to be out in this secular life by day? And then I know a big part of your routine is to pray a lot mm -hmm. in the morning. You pray in the evening. I'm sure you must have all kinds of discussions and ongoing, you know, on, ongoing, uh, you know, intrigue about what it is you choose, you want to do. That's right. But isn't that hard that between the two worlds? I think the living in the house really puts us in a position where we can make a decision as to where we're going to devote most of our time and energies. You know, um, certainly we're here for a reason, all of us, regardless of our age or our place of or, or, or birth of origin. Um, and I think all of us make, have personally made the decision that we're going to do our best to live in community and to live with a desire to know God's will. Father, the men who come there, I mean, they could have been married. Well, uh, maybe their wives had died. Is that, that That's a possibility, right. Uh, it's none of the... Seven guys um, have had that experience, although some have been pretty close to marriage and, and, and had relationships, as, as, as Raphael mentioned. Uh, there are a couple who are in their 30s and a guy who's, who's in his early 50s. And uh, the youngest is, is, is 21, uh, 20. He's going to be 21. Um, our college seminary, there's, there's guys a, a little bit younger than that. Uh, but the House of Discernment is guys later in college and working. And so we have amongst seven guys from 20 years old to early 50s. Let's now turn to you, Rodnev. You are in the seminary. That's right. And you've been studying to be a priest for quite a while. That's correct. What, was this a shock to your family? How did they react when you said, this is what I want to do? Okay, well, some people were surprised. It's funny, half, I guess, were un surprised um, and half kind of saw it coming, you know. Um, when I had gone to college, I didn't think that I was going in to become a priest, right? Even though when I was a young child people thought oh he's gonna be a priest I didn't think so and um, I went to college I thought I was gonna become a doctor and then I started studying, studying psychology but it's towards the end of college that I began um, when I prayed more on it and I spoke to different priests that I began to realize that maybe God is calling me in this direction is there an aha moment that says this is what I want to do I know God has called me not so much, for me at least, not so much. It was more a gradual process, a gradual process of faithfulness to prayer and speaking to, speaking to other priests and people of, of, good, of, you know, of good wisdom. It was, but it was obviously something that came to you in a, in, a, in a relatively kind of progressive fashion. Yes. But do you see, I mean, do you understand how difficult it is for a lot of other young people to, to make that kind of a choice and how the temptation to not do it is so great? I can, I can definitely understand it because our world offers a lot of false, false traps to happiness, you know? And some of them are legitimate and some of them are illegitimate. But I guess the key is knowing that true happiness is, where, is doing what God wants for you and doing what God calls you to do. And so I guess discovering that true prayer. And so the one encouragement I would have is for everyone to just continue praying. Whatever small bit you do, have a relationship with God, because that's when you find out what God wants for you. That's the key to happiness. Raphael, what would you say right now about the odds are for you to actually ultimately seek the priesthood? Um, I would say that the odds are pretty strong. Um, I am uh, right now in the process of applying to, the, to Douglas and the Minor Seminary. So um, I think that having even just for now a brief period of time resided in the House of Discernment, I can kind of feel a confirmation that this is the direction that the Lord wants me to proceed in. Father, I'm curious, do you have like an aha moment when you knew you wanted to be a priest or you knew that was right mm -hmm. for you? Seventh grade, Sister Margaret Mary was uh, <laughs> <laughs> talking about high schools and she mentioned cathedral prep. But that was, I was 13 years old at that time. The second aha moment came when I was 26 after 13 years of wrestling with God. Do I want this? Does God want this for me? Um, I, I thought for a while that I was being called to marriage and was in the seminary, high school really, college and right into the major seminary, but for a few of those years, the later college and in the beginning of the major seminary, I think I had a foot or a foot and a half out the door of the seminary and was thinking of leaving. God works in mysterious ways, and there was a, a real struggle, a spiritual struggle. The seminary gives you a, a spiritual director, um, prayer, so many ways to help discern 
and now there's the house of discernment is an additional help I think that the diocese is giving to guys. Uh, so for me, it was a 13 year period of um, from one aha moment to the, to the next before, from the possibility to, yeah, this is, this is what God wants and I'm ready to say yes. Till the you day know? that you actually were ordained or even? Uh, the, that, that second aha moment came in the spring of 96. I was ordained in June of 97. So um, I was starting to get worried as <laughs> to whether <laughs> I, was gonna, if I was gonna know or not, but uh, thank God in you know, 11 and a half years now, no regrets, no regrets. Well, we're going to talk about um, the sisters in the religious community in just a moment. Thank you, Raphael, for being with us. Thank you, Rodna, very much. We appreciate it. Father Sweeney, if you'll just stay right here. Uh, the shortage of priests is, as I said, only part of the story. When we come back, the nuns part of it. Stay with us. Welcome back. The priest shortage has been severe, but the statistics for women religious are even worse. In 1965, according to one study, there were nearly 180,000 sisters in the United States. Last year, there were less than 60,000. Here to talk about the state of religious vocations for women, Sister Camille Hampton with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Sister Maria Lourdes Prieto, a novice with the Little Sisters of the Poor, and Elizabeth Scalia, who contributes to Inside Catholic and who runs the blog, The Anchoress. Thanks so much for being with us. We truly appreciate it. There's news that the Vatican has initiated what they call an apostolic visitation of institutes for women to take a look at these severe drops in the number of women religious in the United States. Sister, how do you feel about the Vatican paying this kind of attention and, and doing this study, so to speak? Actually. We're quite happy because it shows an interest the Vatican has in the state of religious life in the U.S. And as you said, the numbers have dropped and um, something needs to be um, kind of, uh, there needs to be an encouragement for women religious because they have a vital part to play in the church in this day. And so we're really hopeful that um, it will be a source of regeneration. Yeah. Do you think the Vatican, those sisters, worried that, that they feel like they've got to take some, some very strong steps? I think so, but I think that's a good thing. As Sister said, the Church, I believe, is taking the step to reaffirm women religious. And as Sister said, the necessity and uh, what a great vital role and, and pivotal role women religious have in society and in the world. So. Um, we think that the concern of the, the church to come and visit women religious is great. We're open to it because if there's anything we could do to improve uh, our outreach to y other young women or whatever we can do to uh, better our communities and persevere in our vocation, we're open to that, so we're happy. Do you think that some of what's going on here is because there's been a blurring of the lines between lay people and religious in the Catholic Church? Lay people have taken on so many of the, of the tasks that the religious orders have traditionally done, even during you know, the Mass with deacons, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, just, I'm curious about whether or not there is um, this blurring of the lines means that maybe people are unclear about the, what the role is of women in religious orders. I know the Vatican has reaffirmed time and time again that all, lay pe all, pe all the baptized are called to holiness. That's the Christian vocation. And they've said many times too that um, religious life, we're called to the same holiness, but we're called to a closer following of Christ, a more intimate um, following where God is our all. And that's usually um, for apostolic religious, it's manifested in the service that we render um, in the church's mission. And um, I think that probably does need to be more clear, but I, I think it's beautiful that the lay people are really taking their part in the church and they're making a big difference and I think that's vital at this time too. Elizabeth, I find this hard to believe, but there was a point when you seriously were thinking about being a nun. Can you tell me about that process and what happened? I mean, um, you, were, you were very seriously was involved, in right? Yeah, um, I was seriously contemplating becoming a poor Claire. Um, which is a cloistered order, not an apostolic order. Um, <clears throat> basically, praying all the time for the world. And I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time digesting that, knowing your personality. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can be very quiet sometimes. Um, and this is something that um, 
the, the, the lure of monasticism was very strong in me, and it still is. I'm a Benedictine oblate now. Um, I still pray the office. I simply do it as a lay person. In my case, I prayed and really kind of stomped my foot at God and demanded. I, I said, if this is what you want for me, there's all these obstacles, make it happen, and if it's not what you want, then show me what you have, because darn it, I want an answer. And um, that very night, I got my answer, and I met my husband that night and knew immediately. Uh, the moment I saw him, I said, I said to my aunt, who is he? And she said, well, he's your, your my cousin was going off to become a, a Capuchin, and this was his going away party. And, and uh, I said, is he going to be a priest too? And she said, no. I said, well, good, because I'm going to marry him. So uh, the switch was, it was a light switch. I went from poor Claire to, um, to wife. To wife. Uh, overnight, literally, the mindset flipped overnight. So you would say then that God did, after you stomped your foot, God did give you? I think that if you ask God to tell you what, what he wants of you in your life, uh, or I think if you say to God, what do you want me to do, God will always tell you. If you can eliminate some of the noise and allow that answer to come in. And I think part of the problem with vocations, I think, is not that God's not calling. I think it's simply that there is so much noise in the world, and particularly our young people, they have Facebook and they've got iPod and they've got the constant input that they don't have that quiet space anywhere to hear the small, still voice. Um, I don't think God has ever stopped calling. I just think that we have to find other ways to get people to listen. I, I, that's why I love seeing the habits, because it's another, it's another means. But doesn't, sometimes can't the habits almost be an obstacle? Because there might be young women who say, I don't want to have to dress like that and be different from the rest of the world, even though I will be because of my vocation? I'm just curious about that. Actually, we don't see that so much with our congregation. Um, what we have been offering young women is a come and see. And it's really it's a non-threatening opportunity to either come and volunteer in our mission or to come and spend a few days in prayer with us. And I think they are able to look beyond the habit and see women, consecrated women, dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to their mission. And I think that the habit, it's, it's, it's more than the habit that they're searching for. And uh, it's not a hindrance at all. Sister, do you have an, was there an aha moment for you when you knew that you wanted to be um, a part of the religious order? Um, yes and no. Um, like our brother seminarians were saying, it was somewhat of a gradual process. Um, that entails a lot of prayer. But for me, the aha moment, like, like our brother seminarian, there was too. The one aha moment is the moment of surrender. That's the aha that I'm not in charge. As you said, God, um, asking God, what do you want from me? And to really say, whatever it is you want from me, um, I don't care. That's that surrender. I surrender it all to you because you know best. So that was an aha moment for me, uh, that grace to surrender and, and to conform to his will out of love. And, and then after discerning with the little sisters, uh, they also have a great opportunity for young women who are especially interested in our congregation to even live in the home and work or volunteer full time, but at the same time be exposed to the sisters' prayer life their, their work in the home, uh, but still have that separation, uh, but still follow their way of life and prayer and service and get a better uh, idea of whether or not this is what God is calling them for. And so I was privileged to have that experience. And so during, during that year after prayer, uh, lots of prayer, um, God really revealed to me, I want you to be a little sister of the poor. And to say yes, that's, that's a great moment, a joyful moment. Mm, I'm sure it is. We thank both of you, Sister Camille and Sister Maria Lourdes, for being with us today. Elizabeth, you're going to stay right here because um, we're going to continue to talk around. about vocations and the efforts the church is making to bring more men and women into the religious orders. So uh, we'll be back with some final thoughts after this. Welcome back to In the Arena. We are talking about vocations with Father Kevin Sweeney and Elizabeth Scalia. I want to read to you from an editorial in Commonweal that really says, 
Today's new clergy are not only fewer in number, but also older, less educated, less thoroughly schooled in theology, and less likely to see its relevance to the ministry. Also, the more heavily burdened with responsibilities, especially earlier in their careers. What, what do you say to that? Pretty negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds pretty negative. It's not my experience in terms of the 39 guys that are studying for our diocese right now, uh, some are coming in older, yes, but, but I think that has its challenges, but can be a good thing. Um, sure, they've got life experiences. That's right, they do. And uh, guys in, in, in ordained recently the last five, 10 years, they have some challenges. They're being asked to do a little bit more than the guys were in the last 10 or 20 years. Less educated, I don't know about that. I think we keep our standards pretty high in terms of what the church asks uh, in terms of requirements for education. Not, that hasn't changed a, ho a whole lot. Um, so, some are, might be correct on some points, I would argue with it on some points. Elizabeth? I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing that they're being given ex uh, more responsibility earlier either. Um, you don't have a situation where we had a glut of priests and some priests would be priests for 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. still waiting to get their parish. Um, we're not going to be seeing that. Um, also, I think that could have been written a little more positively. <laughs> but. but um, one thing I read, and I think I just read it in the National Review online, I'm not sure of my source, but I read somewhere that worldwide there are more seminarians now than there were in 1961. Um, the vocations are simply coming out of Asia, Africa. Um, they're not coming from New York and For Los a number Angeles. of different reasons, including it's still considered to be a very, well, it's, it's very prestigious for a family to have a child who will become a priest, but they have larger families as well. I mean, right. there are a number of different issues. I mean, sure, you could cite all of in them. In a culture with less opportunities in terms of college and career, um, the, the priesthood is, um, you're, you're very well educated, you have a certain prestige and that should not be a reason to enter the seminary, but, uh, you know, that's part of life, part of practicality, uh, part of the experience of the church in, let's say, what we might call the third world countries. but. Um, that has its, like everything else, the good and bad aspects, I think. Well, just like the Irish, I mean, you used <laughs> to have right, seven or right. eight kids, and now, it was struggling. a very they're great really, thing to. They're really struggling, yeah. Yeah, and you'd get your education, too. As somebody who's closely connected to the church, and yet a layperson, what do you think the church could do, in a nutshell, to get more people to be interested in vocations? I think that the church needs to tell people God is calling. Um, and, you know, I think we have to be willing to give our children up in that sense. Um, I know as a mother, I only have two sons, and most people have two children. Three children is considered a large family. You have to be willing to say, um, if you want a Eucharistic church, you have to be willing to give up But why are you giving your child up? Well, you are giving up, I want grandchildren. <laughs> you know? and You'll I have want, more spiritual grandchildren than you could ever count. <laughs> I want, you know, I want the kid to come over and mow the lawn for me when I'm older. And know, these things won't happen. I know happen. a priest is, a who up. says the only life better than the life of a priest is the life of a mother of a priest. So uh, I know my mother is pretty happy with me as a priest. I think um, uh, that she's happy that I, I uh, that this is my vocation. Um, but did she ever say to you, though, I'm, I'm giving you up to something else? No, see, that wouldn't have been her understanding. Uh, being born in Ireland and um, a very religious family, uh, she was happy. I often said maybe too happy that I was <laughs> in the seminary. My father was a different story. I didn't really know what he felt, whether positively or negatively. Um, but uh, we do. The, 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 the point that um, parents need to be willing to um, to to say yes to that call along with their child and even in, be happy that their, their child is called uh, to this vocation because ch parents, I think, want their children to be happy. And um, if, if this is God's will, it's, it's a very joyful life. And I, th I think that too often parents do, um, they do not go out of their way to say, this is a good life choice. They, they say, I want you to be a doctor. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And they don't say, I would like you, you know, if you makes you happy to be a little sister of the poor. Um, if one of my kids came to me and said that this is what they wanted to do, if I knew it would make them happy, I would be very happy for them. Mm. And your mother, as you say? She's, th she's too happy sometimes, but <laughs> she's also happy with my sister's two, three kids and my brother's two kids. So, the, you know, there's many blessings. And, there are um, indeed. Uh, and it's a blessing to have had you here, Father <laughs> Sweeney. Thank you so my much. My pleasure. And, and thank you as always, Elizabeth. Nice to be here. That is it. A reminder, you don't need a TV to watch The Net. We are always on online at www.netny.net.
For all of us, I'm Jane Hansen. See you next time in the arena.